Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a little bit of a different stream for you today. I've had a lot of people ask me about framing. They said, you know, we really want to understand different parts of language, the strategy that the left is using on certain issues, the way to approach things rhetorically. And so I wanted to start doing some of these streams where we just kind of think about an issue. We look at a piece of left-wing propaganda. We also call that journalism. Uh, and we take we take a look at we look at the kind of language they're using, the way they're framing the issue, why they're approaching it the way they are. And you know, I can go ahead and take questions from the audience, everything, just kind of talk back to you guys and get an idea of what you're thinking as we're discussing this. But I wanted to kind of hang this on the frame of an article from NPR that came out a few days ago about Christian nationalism. Now, if you want to know more about this topic, I have had a, a stream on this before. I actually had the excellent Paul Vanderclay on to talk about this, its viability and all that kind of stuff. What does the Bible actually say about governance? Uh, it was uh, you know, was the United States really a Christian country? All that kind of stuff. If you're looking for a stream that's going to talk more about that, you can go back and look at that one. That's going to talk more about the kind of the origins of Christian nationalism. Is it a thing? You know, what? how does this connect to the Bible? You know, if, if you're looking for a stream that's going to give you a bunch of citations about whether or not uh, the United States was a Christian country, this won't be the, the one. You might want to go back and watch that one. This one is going to be more focused on the rhetoric uh, of the left and the way that they're using the frame of Christian nationalism. Now, to, to start at the beginning, I want to be very clear, like Christ is king, obviously. Uh, I think, you know, as a Christian should understand that our Christian values do inform everything we do. And the idea that there's some completely secular space where we just kind of check our values at the door and we completely leave our religion behind for some set of neutral principles that run the nation in an efficient way. That, that's just not a real thing. That's not what the left do either, of course, right? A lot of what's going on with this Christian nationalist framing by the left is they want to ex accentuate their advantage in the marketplace of ideas. In the United States, the left have very clearly use the distinction of you know separation of church and state, which you know their definition is nothing like what the founding fathers or or most uh, United States citizens throughout history would have understood the separation of church and state to mean. But they've used this idea that no technically like uh, formally religious religious thing can be entered into the public square as a way to kind of corner off any discussion about Christianity or its values and make any kind of use of Christianity in the moral realm a completely invalid thing for uh, you know federal government or any other piece of the government. And so this has been a very effective tactic for them by setting up secular progressivism as the null hypothesis, the thing that is just automatically understood as true. They've been able to maneuver themselves into a position where any mention of Christian values automatically you know, invalidates the position of the person holding them. And so they want to kind of frame everything in this context. But we want to look a little deeper into this article because I think it reveals a lot about what the left wants to do with the phrase Christian nationalism. Now, some of you probably already have guessed this, but you know, again, United States, it's been a Christian nation the entire time. It's had deeply Christian values and understanding of public life. Uh, it was reflected in all kinds of legislation, both local and federal, uh, uh, recognize that every level, the, the Christian value set is baked in at every level of the United States history and legal procedure, its, its customs, its traditions, all of that. And so th this is nothing new. The idea that, that Christianity might inform some of this stuff is in no way novel or new. However, you've noticed that there's been a rise in the phrase Christian nationalism, explicitly this particular phrase, Christian nationalism. And there's a, there's a very specific reason for that. Again, there are plenty of Christians who thought that Christianity should inform your, your legislative decisions, your values, all of this stuff. I'm one of those people. But this particular phrase was pushed by the media for a reason. Now, I want to be clear at the beginning that I'm not saying that those that use it or those that sincerely advocate for it are themselves, you know, uh, 
people planted somewhere or have nefarious ulterior motives. I think most of them picked up a frame that was pushed by the media for a particular reason because they said, well, I'm a nationalist and I'm a Christian and I want my Christian values to inform the laws of my nation. So I'm a Christian nationalist. And this happens so much with the right that they pick up the framing that the media has pushed, they've actively uh, pushed into the popular consciousness, not realizing why the left has done that or why the media has done that. Again, not casting aspersions on anyone who uses this language. Many of them do so in good faith. In fact, at the end of the day, they might even be right, as we'll, we'll talk about in this. I'm, I'm not even here to tell you don't use this phrasing necessarily. But I just want to I want us to all go into this looking at the way the left wants to use the frame of Christian nationalism so that we can make a more informed decision on kind of how we want to approach this topic. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the beginning uh, from NPR, which again, of course, remember is literally state media. So th this is an article directly from state media. This is not even from CNN or something pretending to be, you know, but anyway, so more than half of Republicans support Christian nationalism, according to a new survey. So first thing you'll see, it says more than half of Republicans support Christian nationalism. Now, as we get in here, we're going to see actually that's not true at all. That was this was created specifically for the splashy headline, but it's journalism. So surprise, surprise. But let's get down here and take a deeper look. So long seen as a fringe viewpoint. So right at the beginning here, we've poisoned the well immediately. Um, no, actually, this is not a fringe viewpoint at all. All this is the default uh, understanding of the American existence for a very long time. Uh, the United States has had this baked into, again, the fabric of its law and tradition for pretty much the entire time that it's been around. So we see right away, uh, we're going to poison the well before we get in here, just completely lying and trying to marginalize something before we've even talked about it. So Christian nationalism now has... Christian nationalism now has a foothold in American politics, particularly in the Republican Party. Well, yeah, I mean, we didn't think you guys were talking about the Socialist Party. Thanks. According to a new survey uh, from the Public uh, Religion Research Institute and the Brookings Institute, of course, these surveys are always very dubious. Uh, as someone who was a reporter who often reported on surveys, you get these packages uh, so just so, for you guys who don't know, the news is written uh, in large part by people who aren't in, theoretically uh, newspaper writers. So what will happen is in a journalist is sitting around. They need to fill column inches. They'll get an email from a institution that wants to push an agenda. It's a press packet. Uh, this is done specifically with polling. So if you think polling is something that's supposed to reflect the, the general understanding of people, that's not what happens. Push polling is done to tell you what the, the people doing it want you to believe. And so these stories show up in journalists' inboxes. They come with basically like a an abstract for the poll. They don't tell you anything about the methodology unless you really get deeply into the methodology. If, unless you're an actual journalist, uh, very few are at this point, and you actually go in and look at what the uh, the methodology was, you might uh, find out, as I did several times when I was a reporter, that the polls that people were putting out and the, the headlines, the abstracts that they were putting out for reporters to kind of copy paste into their stories were completely misleading. If you look at the methodology of the polls, often the, the splashy headline saying, oh, this is the definitive thing that people believe is actually well within the margin of error. So, uh, of course, none of that is linked here. We don't have any information about the quality of these polls. But just so you understand, uh, when people show you polling, they're generally showing you polling for a reason. And most generous report journalists reporting on polling have no idea what they're talking about. They don't understand what was done in the poll. They don't understand how the, that in, information was arrived at. They literally just take the opinions that are formulated by the, by the people who conducted the poll uh, with a specific intentioned outcome in mind. And then they kind of just parrot that back to you in new language, which is why the whole chat, uh, chat GPT thing could just threaten journalists because it can, it can also regurgitate someone else's talking points pretty simply. So, 
Researchers found that more than half of Republicans believe the country should be a strictly Christian nation. I mean, th those are rookie numbers. We got to get those numbers up, right? That, that's, if anything, it's very disappointing that only half of, of Republicans think that, uh, that America should be a Christian nation. But either way, let's, let's look a little more into this. Either adhering to the idea of Christian nationalism, 21%, or sympathizing with those views. So already we see that that half headline was not the case. It's only 20% of respondents uh, that were uh, identifying as Christian nationalists. This 33% sympathizing for those views, what does that mean? At some point they said, yeah, I think the Ten Commandments are like good, and maybe we should work some of that into our law. I mean, come on, it is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so so we don't even have an accurate number from the beginning here. We can already see this is manufactured, but let's hope that uh, let's hope that it's it's higher right at the end of the day. Um, so Robert P. Jones, the president and founder of the nonpartisan PRI, has been uh, surveying the religious world for many years now. Recently, Jones and his group decided to start asking specifically about Christian nationalism. Here's a quote here. It uh, became clear to us that this term Christian nationalism was being used really across the political spectrum. So not just on the right, but on the left. And it has been written about more by the media and again like no surprise of course it was like that this so again this phrase was was manufactured specifically by the media for a particular reason and again i want to reiterate just one more time so everyone hears me i'm not calling out people who use the phrase i'm not saying people who use the phrase have nefarious purpose i'm not saying that they're like suckers who fell for something what i'm saying is they're doing they're they're taking a phrase that was suddenly in very popular use by the media saying this makes sense for what we're doing and we want to talk about it but again this is the the left does this all the time they pick this phrase for a reason again and at the end of the day you have to have something to rally behind maybe that is the right phrase i'm not even here telling you it's not i just want to explore why the left picked the phrase and what they're doing with it, right? So yes, of course, it's now being talked about and written about more in the media. It was specifically designed for that purpose. The left wants to scare its base and it wants to box its opponents and it did it with that phrase for a reason. Christian nationalism is a worldview that claims that the U.S. is a Christian nation. Again, yeah, okay. So the basic thing that's been true for almost the entirety of America's existence Nothing controversial there or nothing that should be controversial unless you get your history from the 1619 Project. And that the country's laws should therefore be rooted in Christian values. So again here, what the left is going to do with this phrase over and over again is they're going to keep asserting, asserting that this is some kind of crazy theocratic idea. The idea that uh, you should have your values rooted in Christian values. You should have your law uh rooted in Christian values. But of course, that's not crazy at all. This is where the largely where the morality of the West and the United States came from. It's what informs almost every social interaction, tradition, norm, uh, all of this stuff throughout American history and most of Western history. And so this idea is in no way radical or new. It's very old and was very normal up until just a few decades ago in the United States. What the left is going to be doing is they're going to be playing the shell game. They're going to be saying, well, this is all radical theocratic stuff. We're for plurality. Now, of course, we know the left is not for plurality at all. The left is for a complete dominance of their progressive worldview. They want that to replace all all morality. They want that to be the central morality that is taught in every school, that is uh, enforced in every business, that is the requirement for every person who joins the military or you know, wants to have a government job or wants to get elected to anything. They want this to be the default. And let's be honest, it already is, right? So th they're casting this as some kind of radical outlier because they certainly don't want to return to the idea that there could be any competition for the values of progressivism. Progressivism is the only secular religion in town. And they're going to, of course, try to leverage the idea that America is based on this idea of pluralism. So you can't have anything but progressivism. Hilariously enough, that's the only thing allowed in your pluralistic society. So here, here comes the real part. This is, this is why they really use the phrase in the first place. So the point of this has long been, uh, or the point of this point of view has long been prominent in white evangelical spaces. There it is. So, uh, but lately it's been getting lip service in Republican ones too. 
So the reason that they chose the phrase Christian nationalism is that they wanted to associate it with white nationalism. That, that's the whole reason that they wanted to push this idea. You'll notice that even though this is supposed to be Christian nationalism, they're never going to talk about the rise of this in Hispanic churches. They're not going to talk about the rise of this in black churches, even if this is something that maybe a number of Hispanic Catholics or something would be interested in. It's only white evangelical spaces that are the problem. And that was, of course, the, the point that they're going to try to push at every opportunity here. During an interview at Turning Point USA, uh, event last August, Representative Major, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene said party leaders need to be more responsive to the party base, uh, which she claimed to be made up of Christian nationalists. Now, you would again hope that there would be a large base of Christians in the Republican Party. Unfortunately, that is something that has been dwindling, but it's certainly true that the majority of uh, Republicans at least have some allegiance to Christianity. And if we're talking about democracy, and this is the funny part you're going to get to here, they're, they're going to talk about how dangerous this is to democracy. But of course, you know, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene's appeal here is exactly to that democratic process, right? It, we should be backing up our base. We should be listening to our base and we should be doing what they tell us to do, what they inform us that we should be doing. So her appeal here is directly to the idea of representative democracy, but we'll see that it's the wrong type of representative democracy. It's the scary Christian one, and that's the one we have to get rid of. We need to be the party of, uh, we need to be the party of nationalism. I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. Jones said that uh, until now, it's been difficult to tell how prominent Christian nationalism is within the Republican Party. Well, yeah, because you just kind of manufactured that term a couple of years ago. Now, again, I, I, one more time, I want to make it clear. There, of course, have been people who have used this term before. Uh, there have been people who have said we need to organize our nation around Christianity. This should be central. Uh, and, and they have been arguing along a, a line of Christian nation, nationalism previously. But this term came into proper or, or rather came into popular use a few years ago, specifically because the media was pushing it very hard. They started uh, floating the, spe the specter of Christian nationalism. And so, yeah, it's not surprising that the phrase wasn't in much use before in the Republican Party. Most people didn't feel the need to have some kind of explicit label on the fact that they wanted Christianity to inform their politics and their law. Uh, there was some data out there, but we saw, uh, uh, but what we saw was a need uh, to have a real set of data that would quantify what the term means, how many Americans really adhere to it, he said. And we also wanted to have a more nuanced view, not just people who had who were hard adherents, but maybe people who were, again, sympathetic. So again, that's how they manufactured the number in the first place, that over 50%, uh, by lumping in the idea of sympathetic people. Again, what does sympathetic mean? Uh, it's never outlined anywhere in this article. It's probably somewhere in the study, but again, journalists just kind of copy paste what's sent to them by these institutes. Um, there's not really any kind of investigation into you know, how that breaks down. Is it someone who has a vague appreciation for the Bible? Is it someone who attends church? Is it someone who thinks that some level of Christian value should be reflected in culture or law? Is it people who believe that only the Bible should be taught in school ever and no one should ever be able to believe in any other religion? No, nothing is clarified here, of course. It's, it's simply people who might be sympathetic. Uh, Jones said that just the beginning of his group's effort to track the prevalence of these views in uh, in America, he says, over time, we'll have a better idea of whether these views are becoming more or less widely held. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a nice little cottage industry for people who want to get uh, sinecures from the left uh, researching Christian nationalism. Americans broadly don't adhere to Christian nationalism. Well, thank, thank you. We appreciate uh, your clarification there. So this is a very looming threat, but also no one believes it. Well, a majority of Republicans currently either adhere to or sympathize with Christian nationalism. So again, we've already changed We've already changed our, our frame uh, to, to kind of incorporate the, the new thing we need to recognize that even though this is a, a growing threat that so many people believe in, actually, uh, we're now going to switch to the idea that democracy and majority rule says that it, it's not a big deal and actually not that many people believe in it. It's actually a weird and fringe thing. So we have this, we have this Schrodinger's ideology 
that at one moment exists and is very dangerous and is growing and is going to dominate all this stuff. And so many people believe in it, but actually no one really believes in it. And it's not that big a deal. It's, it's not the majority. Um, and we'll, we'll see this gets more ridiculous as we go on. So according to the study, only 10% of Americans total view themselves as adherents of Christian nationalism. And only 19% of Americans said that they sympathize with the views. Uh, not sure. Christian Cobes de Muse, maybe is how to pronounce that. A history professor at Calvin University said that it's important to note that this is not a novel ideology in American families. OK, well, at least that part is true. Uh, these ideas have been widely held throughout American history and particularly since the 1970s with the rise of the Christian right. Now, well, uh, some of this was true. So, yeah, of course, these ideas have been held throughout American history. Yes, they were very popular as Christianity dominated the religious land, uh, religious, moral, legal land, cultural landscape of America through centuries. Like, yes, of course, these are not new or novel ideas. They have been the cornerstone of all this stuff for a very long time. Uh, the idea that the Christian right rose in the 1970s. Yeah, no, there, of course, have been many, there, there may have been the rise of a specifically branded political movement. Uh, but this might only have been in response to the perceived attack that this was a general uh, understanding held by the entire population. That's the funny thing about trying to fragment a culture. You start generating interest groups that are very awkward around a very particular issue. Demuse says that these views are mostly a reaction to changing demographics. Here we go again, as well as cultural generational shifts in the United States as it becomes less white and less Christian. So yeah, again, we see what the actual interest is in using Christian nationalism as a frame, right? The, the, the real story is the resentment of the bitter clingers, right? Obama's bitter, bigger, bitter clingers who are holding on to their Bible and their guns in the middle of the rest, but those, those cranky old white people who are getting phased out, uh, or I mean, they're not, we're definitely not, that's not happening, right? We're, <laughs> if you say that, if Tucker Carlson says that, he's an evil racist. So so it's not happening, remember, but it's also really good that it is. So <laughs> we can kind of see our, our, our celebration parallax right here. These things are happening, but they're, you know, but we can't talk about them happening because if we talk about them happening, we're noticing and noticing is very bad, not allowed to do it. She said these adherents want to hold on to their cultural and political power. So here, here this is kind of funny, right? <laughs> this is something the left says a lot. Uh, oh, these, these, you know, old, you know, white people or these old Christians, they, they can't get with the times and they're just, they just want to hang on to their cultural and political power. O okay. So if you believe in a democratic mechanism, if you believe in democratic mechanism and people want to have a say inside that mechanism, inside the democratic process, then why wouldn't Christians, for instance, gather together and lobby for something like Christianity in the public square? I mean, that seems perfectly natural, right? But of course, it's framed as if this is some kind of craven, desperate bid for power. No, you have, again, you, you believe in the democratic process or you're supposed to in this article, right? I'm not a huge fan of democracy, but we'll, we'll get further into that. You're the ones who are supposed to believe in the democratic process, but you're going to scold people for saying, hey, uh, actually, I think that using the democratic process, we should inform the laws being made through the process of, or through the worldview of Christianity. Again, makes perfect sense. I don't understand why this is such a problem, but it's a problem because it's the wrong people availing themselves of the democratic process. And so we need to mock them, of course. In fact, according to the survey, half of Christian nationalist adherents and nearly four in 10 sympathizers said that they would support the idea of an authoritarian leader. There they go. That's what they also want in order to keep these Christian values in society. So remember, the, this framing is particular, right? They chose Christian nationalists because they want to link this to national socialists. That's that's what they want, right? They, they want to make, that's why you always hear them using phrases like, you know, uh, Christo-fascist, or however you're supposed to properly pronounce their made-up terminology, because they specifically want to convey the idea that a belief in Christianity or the idea that Christianity should be a significant part of the culture and should inform your cultural values and your traditions, your legal proceedings, that all this kind of stuff. The idea that all of that is just is just got to be tied to mid-century Germans, right? That that's 
what this whole framing is about. They want to constantly reframe the discussion in this way. Uh, at its root, there are some deeply anti-democratic impulses here. Yep. Okay. So again, uh, when Marjorie Taylor Greene says uh, we should listen to our voters and we should represent their values and we should use the democratic process to infuse our values uh, in the decisions that are being made, democracy is bad. But also Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is talking about all this stuff, she's a threat to democracy, right? Christian nationalism uh, which is talking about using the democratic process to instill these values, to to reflect these values in legislation or in uh, kind of the Christian, the, or rather the uh, United States in general, that's a problem. Uh, so sometimes we're a fan of democracy, sometimes we're not. It just depends if it's our democracy, right? Uh, so, I, uh, so to see uh, that more than half of one political party is committed to Christian nationalism, again, we know that's not true. Just, just just, a basic look at the survey shows it's not true. We can't even look at the actual methodology. We can't even look at the actual data, but just looking at the stuff that is that is reported in this very article by the very vi biased people who are reporting it, we already know that this line is not true, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're making the rhetorical argument. This is the frame. This is the splashy headline. So we're just going to keep using it over and over again. Christian nationalism is dominating a political, a major political party, but also no one believes it. And it's deeply un-American. And yeah, it's, it's, it's just, there's no consistency. There's no consistency at all. I think it explains a lot in terms of our ability to achieve much bipartisan agreement. Again, so, so to be clear, uh, the, the implication is that Democrats have are not Christians, right? Democrats, and okay, but I guess I'll believe you if you say that. Might be some Democrats who have some problems with that. Maybe not. It seems like Democratic Party is, is kind of happy to double down with that at this point, or at least not Christian in any meaningful sense. But uh, but you're, if you're saying there's no uh, there's no ability to have a bipartisan agreement if some people are Christian on the other side, what you're saying is actually the Democrats are just wildly intolerant of Christianity. And there's no overlap. There's no chance for bipartisan agreement if one party is Christian and the Democrats are in power because the Democrats simply have no truck with Christianity. They have no way to find any kind of agreement with Christians. So that's great. That That's a, that's a great frame right here. And then we'll see another uh, amazing piece of rhetoric here as they lump everything in. So the survey also found a correlation between people who hold Christian nationalist views as well as anti-Black, anti-immigrant, anti-Semitic views, anti-Muslim views, and patriarchal views. So surprise, surprise, we're going to poison the well again. We're going guilt by association. If you hold one view of this, you hold all of these views. You hate everyone in the Democratic coalition, and you do all the things that trigger all the civil rights violations and get you a nice FBI investigation. So yeah, shock. Uh, also, this one's fun here. Uh, patriarchal views and anti-Muslim views. So um, Islam kind of kind of patriarchal, kind, kind of a, a big feature of that faith. So it's fun to watch um, them say, well, they might harbor these views and on anti these views. Now, maybe they do, but it's just funny that uh, that they would juxtapose these. Uh, obviously, uh, most Muslims would embrace patriarchal views. They would have no, no uh, problem with at least this portion of Christian nationalism if this was true, which, of course, it's not. But moving on. Republicans need to reckon. I like this word. I like the word reckon when the Democrats use this. This always means that they want something terrible to happen. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that they threw a lot of racial reckoning uh, language around during the George Floyd right? It's Oh, these are fine. It's just a racial reckoning. Uh, so this is kind of always them wishing evil on people uh, whenever they throw a reckoning in here. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that code all the time. Uh, Tim Whitaker, found the, uh, founder of the New Evangelicals, this sounds promising, grew up in the church and now spends his life trying to detangle these kinds of views from the evangelical faith. Yeah, I'm, yeah, uh, I'm sure it's uh, we need to understand that the world of Christian nationalism largely rejects pluralism, which uh, this study shows. So again, this is really interesting. So the Democrats are for pluralism, right? Or if pluralism is American value. 
Um, what does pluralism mean in this context? Well, pluralism means everyone believes what the left believes. Pluralism believes that there is a homogenous uh, moral understanding that d descends directly from the progressive worldview because it is not technically religious, right? Because there's no holy book, because there's no official church, it gets to circumvent all the restrictions that Christianity or other religions fall under. And so it's always the superior faith. And so when we say when we say pluralism, what we mean is everyone should be governed by progressivism. It, it has nothing to do with actual tolerance of viewpoints or differences. They won't tolerate Christians, of course. That, that That's very clear. The FBI is now uh, specifically targeting, we found out, Christian services, right? They're, they're actively uh, looking at uh, traditional Catholic services, ones that use the Latin mass as possible hotbeds for radical activity. So actually federal law enforcement is already showing that it's deeply intolerant of Christianity or actually, you know, religious viewpoints. Uh, when they say pluralism, what they really mean is the complete domination of the public square by leftism. Um, so most Christian nationalists, either adherent or sympathizers, either agree or strongly agree with the notion that they should live in a country full of other Christians. Uh, I think that's actually just how religion works, <laughs> or at least proselytizing religions, right? Like uh, Christianity wants to spread the Christian religion to everyone. Ooh, yeah, you got us, guys. Boom. You know, that's well, shocker. Yeah, it turns out that the the religion that explicitly says go and make all men disciples of this religion and spread it everywhere. Uh, yeah, they, they would like the people around them to be Christians. Amazing. It doesn't imply anything about forced conversions or any other ridiculous extreme nonsense, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're going to pretend like that. You know, this guy is, of course, from the new evangelicals. So I'm sure he, he's got a deep deep and abiding Christian faith that compels him to say other people shouldn't be Christians. Uh, Whitaker said his faith, uh, that he has faith that most Americans will continue to reject these ideas when they hear them, but he's worried about the outsized influence of the Republican Party. So which is it? Okay, is this a direct threat? Is this a popular thing? Is this a massive movement that's captured over half of one of the uh, one of the two big parties in the United States? Or is it this thing that everyone's going to reject and it's not a big deal and it's actually this minority viewpoint? Like pick one. We can't like we can't get between paragraphs without them doing this over and over again. In reality, uh, the reality is that a lot of folks, especially the adherents, are very militant. There you go. There you go. Are very militant in this belief that God has given them a mandate to rule over the nation. Uh, so militant's an interesting word there. But while we're talking about a mandate to rule the nation, uh, you don't think that the left thinks it has a mandate to rule the nation? This is probably the 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 most politically impressive thing about the left as compared to the right, the left thinks it has the mandate of heaven. It, think it thinks it has the right to rule. That's how politics works, by the way. Okay, the team that wants to win always beats the team that wants to be left alone. If you believe you have the right to rule, especially in a place that's supposed to have popular sovereignty, you are far more likely to succeed. So the idea that, oh, God gave us a right to rule, well, who do you think progressives think gave them the right to rule? Like, what, science or something? I, I, they're, 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 the, you know, the, they're on the right side of history. They, so they just have some other name. They just have some other uh, justification, some metaphysical or, or quasi-metaphysical justification for their right to rule. But make no mistake, the left thinks they have the right to rule much more than any Christian nationalist, sadly enough. And so they are more than willing to push their ideas onto everyone through force of law at every opportunity. Uh, and so for them, I think that a compromise is a sign of weakness and the GOP needs to understand what they're dealing with. To be clear, yeah, compromise is a sign of weakness, but that's all the GOP does. So surprise, surprise. According to the survey, adherents of Christian nationalism say that uh, they're uh, that they will go to great lengths to impose their vision on the country. Uh, great lengths like, I don't know, creating children transition clinics that'll go around mutilating. Oh no, that's the left. That's what the left does. Uh, but yeah, Jones uh, said that they found adherents are far more likely to agree with statements. True patriots might have to resort to violence. So this, this is the whole point, right? What they want to do is frame 
Christian nationalism as this dangerous extremist movement. They want to reframe a majority opinion, one that was held throughout American history, one that was central to the American story, American law, American tradition, uh, American culture throughout the entire American history until just a few decades ago. And they want to reframe this as a radical insurgent movement that is interested in violence. And they want to do this because they want to justify the persecution of Christians. That's what this is about. They want to use this frame as a legitimating, legitimating mechanism to bring state power to bear on practicing Christians. They already do this all the time. It's already almost impossible for a actual Bible-believing practicing Christian to do basic things like get a job in the government or, you know, get a job in a major corporation to just have any, you know, you, you can lose all kinds of stuff. You can, you know, get deplatformed from everything for just, you know, having basic Christian beliefs and espousing them anywhere. So this is already something that in the process, we already know the FBI is targeting Christians specifically, that's only going to expand. This That's what this framing is for, right, is to, to build this justification. Uh, now, is that everyone? No, it's not everyone. Well, yeah, of course it's not everyone. Literally, you just said so in the statistics. Uh, but it's a sizable minority. Again, we're not sure if we're worried about that or not that are not only willing to declare themselves opposed to pluralism and democracy. Now, again, actually, Marjorie Taylor Greene said, said specifically, I would like to do democracy, please. Um, however you might feel about democracy, she said that. She said, I want to represent my constituents. My base says we would prefer a Christian nation. We prefer Christian values in our nation. I would like to represent them the way that the Constitution says I'm supposed to. So is she opposed to democracy? Well, yes, because in this sentence, what does democracy mean in this sentence? What democracy mean in this sentence is whatever the left wants, right? Democracy isn't democracy unless it's enforcing the ideology of the left, progressives, when they say pluralism here, they mean rule by the left. When they say democracy, they mean the progressive ideology. That's what those words actually mean here. And I am willing to fight and either kill or harm my fellow Americans to keep it that way. Again, this demonization and attempt to link a basic belief in biblical Christianity to violence. That's what this is all about. All right, guys, so that's the end of the article. Um, sorry, it went a little longer than I expected to, but hopefully that made some sense here. Let me go ahead and grab some questions. We've got some super chats here, and then I'll go back and try to answer as many questions as I can, because like I said, I want these streams to be a little more interactive. It's you know Normally, I've got a guest, and we're talking the whole time, and we just kind of grab uh, comments at the end, but I'm hoping that we can do a little more uh, back and forth on these. And, you know, it makes makes a little more sense to have a dialogue around this stuff. So let me pull up the super chats here. I've got a few. All right. So Creeper Weirdo for $5. Thank you very much, sir. Do you think they use this because they couldn't make nationalism scary itself? Or is it just to use uh, the funny boogeyman. So yeah, that, that's a good question, right? So Donald Trump, they, they remember when the left lost their mind because Donald Trump is like, yeah, I'm a nationalist. Uh, they don't even know what that means, right? The, the, the fun thing about nationalism is it doesn't even have a real definition for most of these people. It's just a magical word that means bad at this point. But there is some confusion. I think you're right that nationalism in and of itself wasn't a scary enough for them. They needed to add some other elements. They needed to create uh, other boogeymen. And so that's why they needed to modify it. I think it was, a again, an attempt to kind of roll up a couple of groups that they see as a threat to con total progressive hegemony uh, in kind of one swoop. And that's kind of why they wanted this term to be the term that they were going to push as kind of the scary thing that everyone need to worry about. And like I showed with kind of the narrative there, you can see uh, that there were many different ways where they're trying to tie it, of course, to mid-century Germans National Socialism. That, that's the obvious play that they're trying to make here. Maybe that's going to fail. Uh, maybe this is this has been foolish on their part. Um, but uh, but that is what they wanted to do here. Got a few more super chats. Uh, so uh, the creeper weirdo again. Thank you very much. So we have a religious right and a godless left. Yes, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Of course. Uh, many people have pointed out that the left is not always afraid, of course, of Christianity. Uh, they're more than happy to stand on the, uh, you know, the stage in black churches and tell them you have to go vote for Democrats uh, and, and all this reason. So it's not just this, but there is a, there is like a serious attempt to 
get rid of any Christianity that might override other political concerns, uh, right? Like if, if there's a Christian, if there's a Christianity that actually has teeth that wants to see its worldview implemented through law reflected in what's taught in schools or what the cultural norms are, or what's allowed in certain venues, that's a, that's a problem. And so I think that, uh, it is very foolish. Again, the, there was this, uh, we can't have compromises. There is there is no way to make a compromise if the right is Christian, right? Which is amazing that, that you're going to say we can't have any bipartisan compromise because, well, the Democrats just can't agree with any kind of Christianity. So that's, that's a very telling admission um, uh, of kind of where they see Christianity and how they respond to it. Uh, let's see, Adam E. for $5.00. I worry a feminine interpretation of Christianity will be uh, be uh, mainstreamed to contain Christian nationalism. He gets us is an ad campaign to this effect. Yeah, let's talk about he gets us here for a second. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I saw the Super Bowl commercial like everyone else, um, and I didn't know anything about the group when it aired. Uh, and I could tell by the framing that this was a group that was probably kind of more left wing, a little more, or at least a little more. Um, you know, hippie, I guess is the is the phrase you want to you want to put to it in its Christian approach. Um, they they very clearly were kind kind of they're trying to strike a balance. They're trying to show both sides being angry and that you know Jesus brings us together. And to be clear, Jesus should bring us together. But you could kind of feel by the spirit of the commercial that there's probably a social justice element to it. And sure enough, uh, with a little bit of research, th th there is. It's it's very much got a, a, a social justice bent. It's, it's not a particularly aggressive right-wing version of Christianity. But the funny thing about it is that, uh, and to be very clear, Christianity should not be... Uh, that. Your, your political leaning should not determine Christianity, but that, that's another discussion. Uh, so... Uh, what's interesting is the response to this commercial, right? That this commercial was very offensive to the left. You had uh, uh, AOC out there uh, dissing this commercial, saying that it's covering for fascism. You had uh, people, and I think it was a Jacobin magazine saying, oh, don't, don't fall for the social justice part of this. At the end of the day, it's making, excuse me, it making apologies for fascism and all this stuff. So again, they couldn't even let a left wing group try to promote some level of Christian understanding, right? We talk about an inability to create bipartisan, bipartisan consensus. The left couldn't let any version of Christianity, even a very left leaning, very soft, a very social justice-y uh, kind of dilution of Christianity. Uh, they couldn't let that into the public square. Even that was offensive to them. They went running for the hills. They, you know, they they hissed and pulled back like a vampire in front of a cross. So it's just interesting. You, to be really clear, it's, you know, there is no acceptable version of Christianity except one that just completely conforms to the left. And sadly, there are many churches at this point. There are a number of, of denominations who are trying to head that direction. They're, they're trying to uh, give into the popular zeitgeist and to the state at every turn. Uh, they're tripping over themselves to do this. Uh, it's gross. It's, it's, it's uh, horrible. Um, it, it's heretical, <laughs> you know, obviously. Um, but uh, they're doing it. So, so this does exist, but even, even any kind of Christianity, any kind of, uh, even, you know, just, just a very basic, let's all come together under Jesus message is just too much for the left. They can't handle it. And so, um, do, do I think that there'll be a, a more feminine interpretation or just a softer interpretation of Christianity that will kind of, uh, contain Christian nationalism? I, I don't know. Uh, again, it's hard to know where this language is going to go. Like I said, one more time, just for everybody, because I know uh, you know talking about this can can get a lot of people angry in one one sense or another. I'm not trashing people who use this term. I'm not saying that they're not doing so in good faith. There there are many people who are doing so in good faith. I'm just exploring the rhetorical ramifications and the way the left brought this. Maybe this was a fool's errand by the left. Maybe they've built a monster they can't contain. Maybe they've awakened. Uh, something in Christianity that will strengthen it and cause it to fight back against the complete uh, totalizing of progressive ideology. I sure hope that's true. Uh, so, so maybe that's going to be their their mistake. But I just want us to understand why the left did what they did and why they're implementing their program and talking about it the way that they have. Uh, 
Christian Smitherman for two dollars. Have you thought about talking to Stephen Wolf? I have. Yeah, I, I've, I see Stephen on Twitter. Follow him there. Uh, and uh, I have thought about that. I probably will at some point. Like I said, I've already done one stream on this with Paul Vanderclay. If you want to go back and watch it, I think he gave a very good, um, a very good kind of layout of the history, the biblical understanding of how our values should inform governance. And we also touched on some of the issues. Paul is a, is an active minister. Um, he's a very bright guy. Um, and, uh, you know, basically his conclusion was, of course, our Christianity should be reflected in the laws and culture of our nation. But I would not preach Christian nationalism from a pulpit because, because our church is not strictly a political entity. Uh, which I think is probably the right thing. Like you do need spheres where politics doesn't destroy and sully everything. And that's not to say don't understand what's going on. And it's not to say that the church should have nothing to say about political decisions. It should. But I, I do think there is probably some wisdom to saying that you shouldn't just get up there and say, we adhere to this exact you know, mainstream political movement because that's that's the only thing that Christians do. Uh, that that does make it difficult for people to hear the more important things that should be coming from uh, from kind of your your Christian uh, ministry. Uh, restoring your order here with just a donation. Thank you very much, Restoring Order. Appreciate that, Patrick Casey. Let's see, uh, David here also with a donation. For some reason, it's not showing up. Uh, I think it's I think it's ten euros. But thank you very much, David. I appreciate that as well. All right, guys. Well, got near the end here. I'm probably going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, like I said, I'm probably going to do more of these where I'm kind of just by myself, but we take a piece of leftist uh, kind of propaganda or left-wing framing and we break down all the issues that are underlying it, why they're using the language they're using, why they're approaching the topic the way they are, and kind of what we should think about it. It's nice to have you guys here asking questions, helping me think about it, because I'm processing this too. I just want to be completely honest. I, I have impulses. I have thoughts about kind of how this approaches. I've got people like Academic Agent, who I think make some interesting points about Christian nationalism. So there, there are a lot of thoughts moving around, um, you know, and I haven't completely settled one direction or the other on this. Uh, but guys like Paul Vanderclay and, and others, I think have spoken well on this. And I am interested to talk about uh, Stephen Wolf. I know he has he has uh, wrote, written a book about this and uh, probably has thought deeply about it. So definitely want to, to entertain more thinkers on this topic before just kind of jumping to a particular conclusion. But what do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of more about the language, the political power, uh, the, the way framing is used, how rhetoric works. And so I thought I'd bring that aspect to it. And, and hopefully we'll have some more streams like this, not necessarily just on Christian nationalism, but, but other things where I see a piece that's written by the left, or I see the, the way the left is using language or a frame, and we kind of address that. So thanks for coming by, guys. As always, if you know this is your first time here, please go ahead and subscribe. You know, like the video, all that stuff. Uh, if you want to listen on podcasts, remember that this stuff goes onto all your major podcast platforms. Go ahead and go to the Warren McIntyre Show. Please leave that rating and review. That's such a big help, guys. Just take that extra minute in like Apple or Spotify or something, and just go ahead and give that extra. Uh, rating that really helps with everything. And then, of course, you can catch all these episodes on Blaze TV as well. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my Substack, YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, if you want to follow on Twitter, Gab, all that stuff is down below. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, I will talk to you next time.